So I guess it's time to start. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Robert Montano, and I will talk to you about an unlikely combination of Java agents and OSGI. Click. Click. Um, to start off, a few words about myself. I am currently working for Adobe uh, in Basel, Switzerland, although I'm originally from Bucharest, Romania. I'm working on a product called Adobe Experience Manager, which is basically a, our a content management system. Um, that product has strong roots in projects hosted at the Apache Software Foundation, um, Apache Sling, Apache Felix, Apache Jackrabbit. Um, I'm currently serving as the PMC chair of Apache Sling, and uh, I'm a committer for Felix, committer and PMC member for Jackrabbit. Um, <clears throat> I'm also on Twitter, but that's uh, something of less importance than I, than I like to think. So for today, I will start off with a quick demo about Java agents. Then we will progressively go deeper into the subject matter. So that means talking about the fundamentals of Java agents, asking about the all important why, think why do we want to use Java agents? I will be talking about OSGI integration and integration testing because that is a very interesting topic when it comes to Java agents. At the end, I will do a more full-fledged demo just to show how, uh, how things work in uh, more or less in real life. So for the quick demo, I have something prepared here, which is a very, very simple Java application. It's probably the thing which most of us have written for the first time, a static void main uh, with a system out print line. Now, of course, the expectation is that when you run such a, uh, such a class, you will only get hello world printed on the console. And surprisingly, there's something more. The world says hello back. Now, because this is a talk about Java agents, you probably expected a bit of mischief from me. So this is not going to be the most visible thing in the world, but if you take a look at the VM arguments, there is a Java agent flag here, which basically tells the JVM, let me put this uh, a bit larger, basically tells the JVA, hey, launch with this particular agent. Right? So that's the kind of things we can expect for Java agents. How do Java agents actually work? How do we start writing one? So the answer is neatly put in the Java doc, although maybe a bit opaque. So the Java Lang instrument uh, package has been there for some quite some time in Java, and it provides services that allow Java programming language agents to instrument programs running on the JVM. And right, the agents are the things which we write, which we implement, and by instrumenting, we basically mean rewriting the bytecode. We are still tied to the rules of the Java virtual machine and the Java programming language. But other than that, we can, by rewriting bytecode, we can basically do anything without touching the original source code or the jar files. It's all done on the fly at runtime. So I typically split these agents in two. I, I call the first category static agents. And these are the ones, like the one you just saw earlier. There is a flag that you give to your Java application startup, and that flag is a location on disk to a jar file, and say, hey, launch my application, but with this just Java agent. And you can have multiple agents if needed. And then the runtime will inspect the manifest of that agent and is going to look for an entry called pre main class. And that in turn points to a fully qualified class name, which is an agent. And that agent should 
in turn have a method called pre-main and no, that's a subtle signal that it comes before the main method, so pre-main, um, which takes uh, a string argument, so not a string array, just a single string, and that allows you to pass various command line arguments to, uh, to your agent and an instrumentation class. Now, as you see here, the instrumentation class is the entry point. And th this is what allows you to register various um, transformers, various classes, sorry, versus several implementations that will do the actual work. On the other hand, you can have dynamic agents. Dynamic agents do not force you to uh, update the command line, inter uh, sorry, the launch, uh, the launch command to your application. You can do this dynamically. Once you have a running JVM and you know its process identifier, its bid, you can attach and then load an agent. Now, this looks very nice and convenient, but there are a couple of things to note. First of all, this is um, Sun slash Oracle specific API, the virtual machine. It is not necessarily available everywhere. Second, as of Java 8 or 9, you are no longer allowed to self-attach agents to the Java virtual machine. So this VM process identifier cannot be the, the process identifier of the application running this code. Of course, as with uh, all interesting challenges, there's a library who does that. Um, but again, it's something to keep in mind. And this agent is still a file, a path to a jar file on disk. Uh, there is no fancy network loading, no abstraction playing into here. It still has to be available on, on the file system that is accessible to the currently running Java virtual machine. And there is also a requirement for a manifest entry called agent class this time that again points to a fully qualified class name. And the agent class implementation will look a lot like the pre-main method. It's called agent main, but then it has the exact same signature. It takes a string argument and has this instrumentation entry point class. Now that we're over that, I would like to talk to you about the class file transformer, which is the interface that you'll be implementing to write actual Java agents. And probably the first two things you will be looking at is the class file name. Because as a Java agent, you will have, you'll probably not want to transform all the classes loaded by JVM, by the JVM you'll have a, a set of classes that you will want to inspect. And most often the criteria is uh, the class name. Whether you want to look some, for some class name patterns or package names, or even dynamically inspect the class definition to look for say annotations or common superclass, the entry point is usually this class name. And then you will have access to the class file buffer, which is the bytecode, the current definition of the Java class that is being transformed. Now, being an OSGI talk, I will not uh, avoid talking about the class loader. So the class loader is extremely important because it gives you the exact class loader that was used to load this class definition. And when you load it uh, as, in a, as you're in a structured, class loader aware or multi-class loader environment, you will not implicitly have access to all the classes, for instance, the super classes um, or various classes that you want to work with. So you need to take this into account. And further on, I mentioned this byte argument, the class file buffer. And it turns out that this bytecode follows some very specific rules um, laid down in the Java virtual machine, machine specification. Um, 
it had it, it is composed of a number of uh, bytecode instructions or operations. Uh, there are around 200 defined at uh, a given moment. And is it's basically what you get if you inspect a compiled class while using, for instance, the Java P command line tool. So a very simple hello world program has basically compiles to the following instructions. So you have a get static opcode, which takes the argument number 16. Now that argument goes back to the class Java uh, constant pool definition for that class. So there is something of a header which defines all the constants available. And Java has helpfully listed uh, that number 16 points to system out. Right, and, and then you load an argument on the stack that is the string hello world, um, it's constant number 22. And then you call the invoke virtual method, which surprisingly invokes a vir virtual method, number 24 in the constant pool as print stream print line, taking a string argument and returning a void method. Now, the reason for my showing you this is to give you a sense of the kind of work that writing bytecode involves. Now, you may be the kind of person that says, hey, I'll take this as a challenge and hammer something out during a weekend or a couple of evenings. But it quickly turns from fun into a chore. There are obviously a number of libraries that handle this kind of work for you. And I strongly recommend, advise that you, you pick one of them I will not recommend something. There are these are listed in alphabetical order following a quick web search. You will obviously need to make a decision based on licensing, community size, feature set, high level versus low level support, etc. Now, for my work, I I chose to use JavaSyst, which will struck a good compromise for me. And this is a very basic implementation of a Java agent of a tra class file transformer using Java Syst. So first of all, the entry point is something called a class pool. That is the Java agent object that gives you access to all the class definition. And then you say, hey, I, this descriptor to Java name transforms the class name that the instrumentation API gives you into something which JavaSys can work with. And then you ask for a method. For this class name, give me the main method. And then JavaSys is nice enough to give you a, um, a method that says insert this code at the end of the method. Yeah, and here uh, you can see how nice it is to write Java code in strings by hand, but it works. To wrap up, we say we take the class and generate the new bytecode. Clean up, and then inside the transform method, we have the option of returning a byte array, which is the new bytecode. We can also return null, uh, but in, and in that case, the instrumentation framework will know that we do not want to transform that class. So, but back to the important questions. When would we want to use Java agents? So these are some rules of the thumb that I use for, for writing Java agents. And the first one is it has to be code that I do not control or that you do not control. In my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense to write a Java agent, which is a more difficult task for code that you can alter. If, I mean, you can just change it, right? Um, then you should ask yourself, do I have some platform facilities? Now, if you're working with, uh, let's say the servlet API, there are tons of filters and listeners and whatnot. OSGI has a rich uh, service layer of dependency injection and eventing and whatever do we actually have a better platform facility to use 
instead of writing a Java agent. And then I say, usually these need to be cross-cutting concerns. So touching code in multiple areas, pardon, that is not that easy to patch out or alter in creative ways. If it's just one or two classes, if you have the source code available, it's usually much easier to just fork the code, deploy it somewhere where it is accessible to you as a jar file, and then replace it. Or you can get to creative class path tricks, embedding, you know, just, I would personally avoid writing agents or using agents um, for modifying one or two classes. That being said, some real life examples where I've seen agent use are, for instance, monitoring. There are a number of services that say, hey, I will gather all the uncaught exceptions in your application, ship them to my system, and then I will give you a nice dashboard with it. Or um, I will gather performance data from your application. Um, and that is usually, in these kinds of applications, look for the less least invasive way of being included. And for Java, that is a Java agent. It allows them to rewrite more or less your application to add their instrumentation at various points without you needing to touch anything. Profiling is another interesting area because it allows um, a profiler to attach to an application at runtime using the dynamic uh, agent approach and to instrument various methods, um, insert a before and after and ship that profiling data somewhere. It is simple and non-invasive. Debugging is a sort of a, a mixed scenario here. I, on one hand, I firmly believe that you should not be making code changes in production, uncontrolled code changes in production, uh, like editing JSPs or something like that. On the other hand, there are scenarios where you might say, hey, the my application is in a pretty bad state. I cannot recover more information from it. I did not insert the right logging statements or my metrics are not collecting anymore. What do I do? If I restart, I will never know what happened. So this is where a Java agent can help. You attach a Java agent, you insert some debugging, some log statements, extract the data that you need, and then just restart the application or reset it to a good state. Mocking libraries is uh, also something that can be used to circumvent uh, the, the way um, the Java virtual machine works, right? There are mocking static methods or final methods is something that uh, is, is much better achieved by using a Java agent. And at the end, code reload or hot swap, there are products and open source projects that allow you to reload the, the code. They deploy an instrument version of the class. And when they detect a change on disk, they reload the class with the, the new bytecode. But on the other hand, we have OSJ for that. So that's less of a concern. Talking about OSGI. Now, of course, one of the, th the first tough lessons when getting OSGI is that there isn't a flat class path and that we need to be mindful of class loaders. So this is part of an actual patch, uh, an actual commit that I made to, uh, to, uh, to a, a Java agent, making it work from, like, from plain default applications to OSGI applications. As opposed to getting a default class pool, which is, has a very narrow definition for Java Sys, we create a class path that with the true argument, sorry, a class pool uh, with the default argument, which says it inherits the, the default, the system class path. And then we take a loader class path, which construct inserts 
all the classes that are available in the class loader passed to us by the instrumentation API. And finally, a, a byte array class path, which represents the class we are currently transforming. And then things start working on, in OSGI. Another interesting point that is made due to the modular nature of OSGI applications is that if you rewrite a class such as that it depends on a package that is not currently imported by the bundle, it will fail spectacularly at runtime. So there are a couple of ways around that. Um, you can process, so you can take the bundle object and alter it at runtime. You can even throw your hands in here, give up and say this bundle dynamically imports all packages, which is, well, a bad idea. But the key point here is that it's not as quite as simple to add new dependencies to, to a class when you're running in an OSJ environment. And well, as I was talking about better platform alternatives, turns out OSGI does have a better alternative, which is uh, a weaving hook or the weaving hooks. And it's much easier to deploy. It's an OSJ bundle. So, you, and it's ready, you just create a service and register it via the OSJ whiteboard. And you don't have to mess with command line arguments or um, trying to dynamically attach an agent you deploy, you provision your OHI application in exactly the same way as before, just that you include an extra bundle. And it has a no, an, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it has ways to dynamically update the bundle imports. So it seems to tick all the checkboxes with the drawback that it's an OHI only solution. And well, I say it's a drawback because getting a bit ahead of myself, uh, this time, one of the major challenges with Java agents is testing. So that means you will have, besides your regular testing harnesses, you will have to have OSGI specific testing harnesses as well. And it's a situation where you need to ask yourself, do I want to support only OSGI applications? Do I want to use regular launchers? So via the Java agent flags, or do I want to support both? And if you have the resources to support both, that's fine. If not, a, a potentially pragmatic approach is to say, I will only support the command line launch or the dynamic Java agent launch because it works with OSGI applications anyway. Keeping that in mind, this is a simplified implementation of a weaving hook. If you take a look at the body of the implementation, it is basically the same as the, the regular Java agent implementation. It still relies on a class pool and uh, on the Java sys class and method objects. And we insert some code before. The major difference is that we get passed in a woven class parameter, which has a set bytes method. Um, and that this woven class object allows us to access the bundle, the bundle, and by extension, the class loader. And it has, it's just, in my opinion, a nicer API. And of course, it has all the benefits of OSGI integration. Now, talking about integration testing, I am very much used and enjoy writing simple unit tests that run quickly, fail fast, can be debugged, etc. On the other hand, Java agents, they have to, they, you cannot run them as plain Java classes. This, they must be packaged as jar files and they have requirements in the manifest. It's not trivial to attach them to the current process. And even if it would be, it is quite complicated to support rolling back changes that the Java agent has done. It's going to be either memory or compute intensive, probably memory intensive. 
and it's something that you probably do not want to pollute production code with. So usually end up with a test launcher that launches the Java agents as external processes. So I, I call these unit tests with air quotes because I they can be made to test a single thing, your transformer, uh, but these are more heavyweight. So you, the approach is basically to launch a, a Java process that has a custom agent attached. And then you need to ask yourself, okay, so how do I communicate with the Java agent? How do I know that it actually worked? And additionally, there is no out of the box support for cold coverage and other tools that you might be using in your regular build life cycle. Now I ended up with a simple and simplistic solution that ends up working quite well. So this is a sketch. First of all, we need to find the Java executable and looking for the Java that home property usually works because it's the same JVM as the one launching the test and it allows you to launch the agent test with more multiple Java versions just by giving them a different Java home. Then we need to find the agent jar. And usually if you're running Maven, that's usually somewhere below the target directory and with a jar extension and follows a certain naming convention. And then you need to build a class path. If there are any external dependencies for your tests, not necessarily for your agent. And I'll take a little step back and mention that Java agents do not have access to the application class path. So they should have all their dependencies bundled in. Right, so we, we now build the testing class path and use the regular Java APIs to build a new process, give it this Java agent argument, and then it's basically Java dash Java agent followed by the class path and you know, a test application that is used to, to run the tests. And yeah, uh, the simplest thing that I found to work is to log some things on standard out in, in the test application, uh, throw a stack trace uh, if things don't go wrong and set an exit code to something other than zero. Code coverage is actually surprisingly simple as long as we have the code coverage agent, whether it's the Jacoco jar or something else, we can just pass it to our test harness, but before our Java agent. Otherwise, obviously would not instrument uh, our Java agent, so code coverage data will not be useful. Obviously, we have a, a nice setup for testing with OSGI with Pax exam. So we use the same Java agent option and we give it our agent jar. And then we need to do the work of asserting that the agent actually works. And of course, it must run in a Ford container. Otherwise, the JVM and these VM options, sorry, that these VM options will not apply to the JVM. Okay, it's time to get into the a bit more involved demo. So make this just a bit smaller. So this is how the simple agent that I demoed before works. There is a class to transform that I'm checking. And if this is not the class I want to transform, just return null. And these are the JavaSyst APIs. I get a class pool. Uh, I get a hold of a main method and then insert some code. As for the weaving hook, the weaving hook is, let me turn on word wrap. I think it makes things slightly more readable. These are the class pool objects that I'm constructing using this woven class. So the, using the class definition and the bundles class loader. 
And in the end, I set the transformed bytecode. Now, the actual agent that uh, motivated this talk is an agent that helps forgetful developers in case they make network calls and they forget to set timeouts, which when, when it's not needed, it's okay, but when it's needed and it's not there, it's disastrous. So what this agent does is read some command line arguments. So this is done as manual as it gets uh, because there are really no external libraries packed in, uh, packed in the agent. So we support setting both a connect and the read timeout. And then we have a set of transformers. Now, out of care of not setting timeouts on socket connections directly and just overreaching, there are implementations for a number of libraries starting from the default java.net, uh, HTTP client library, and also for a couple of other libraries. So by so these are the classes that we support sunnet dub dub etc the http and the https variant and luckily they have this both have this connect method where i can insert this check if the con configure connect timeout is zero so wait indefinitely then I will set the connect timeout to whatever it has been configured. And the same goes for read timeout. Oh, there are other a bit more interesting um, ones such as when you want to, when you have a factory method like we do for the HTTP client three, which create param, has create params and works on an object and returns it you do not know the name of that parameter. Right? So Java sys just has this nice dollar underscore method that says info that it will be resolved as the object which is going to be returned from, from the method. And we actually wrote a, uh, a test application that is a uh, not rocket science, it basically supports each of the launchers and accepts a URL and tries to connect to it using various libraries. And this is how it works. So this is Java dash Java agent. I probably should have made that jump jar to something shorter. And then you, you see here, the equals after the name is how we pass command line arguments. And the first argument is the connect timeout in milliseconds. And the second one is the read timeout in milliseconds. Class path arguments, class name. And here we are using HC4, which means HTTP client four. Now let me edit that briefly. and give it no actual timeouts. Well, sorry, just one second timeout. So um, it loaded the URL just fine. Now, if I give it a connect timeout of one millisecond, so again, this is an argument to the Java agent. It's not interpreted by the application. The application never sees this. It will fail immediately that it cannot connect to this host. Let's reset it and in a similar manner, if I tell it to set the read timeout, it gives me a read timeout. And this works if you do, if you use other libraries, you will see it's a different stack trace, but still the same connect timeout. Now I think I have about uh, five minutes left. So these, I will leave this resources slide for a couple of resources. Um, so the Java instrumentation entry point, Java assists, the 
uh, bytecode generation library and the Slink connection timeout agent, which is um, the thing I've demoed at the end. And um, if there are any questions, I am happy to take them now. So I'm looking at the event chat. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if there are, uh, probably there aren't any questions or maybe someone is typing. I will wait for just a bit more. Okay, so uh, I guess no questions. Thank you for, very much for your time. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, uh, either through the conference chat or, um, Twitter or email, uh, these are easily accessible. Thank you very much.